Tyree. Tonight at 10, French voters reject traditional parties in a political earthquake as two outsiders are chosen to go head-to-head -head in the presidential election. The centrist Emmanuel Macron is through to the next round of voting, having promised a new kind of politics. And he'll take on the far right's Marine Le Pen, who says the survival of France itself is at stake in the election. The socialists and republicans who've governed France for more than half a century trailed well behind. We'll have the very latest on a crucial night for French and European politics. Also on the programme. Jeremy Corbyn won't commit to renewing the Trident weapons system, but Labour says it will back the nuclear deterrent. There's a royal send-off for tens of thousands of runners in this year's London Marathon. And Arsenal do it in extra time, reaching the FA Cup final after beating Manchester City at Wembley. Good evening. The people of France, in a stunning result, have rejected candidates from the two main political parties in the first round of the presidential election. Partial results suggest the centrist Emmanuel Macron, who's never held elected office and served as economy minister under President Hollande, and Marine Le Pen of the far-right Front National will contest the final round of voting next month. They've styled themselves as outsiders offering a new kind of politics, but they do represent two very different visions of what France should be. Our first report tonight is from our Europe editor, Katja Adler. One presidential election, two rival visions for France. Fresh-faced Emmanuel Macron tops poll projections, promising fairer government, neither right nor left-wing. A pro-EU centrist, confident of success. Je souhaite, dans 15 jours, I hope that in a fortnight, I will become your president. Le président de tout le peuple de France. I want to become the president of all the people of France. The president of the patriots in the face of the threat from the nationalists. A president able to protect, to transform, and to build. Emmanuel Macron now goes through to the second and final round of France's vote for president. Against... Far-right Marine Le Pen. Anti-immigration, anti-globalization and anti-EU. Her presidential plan? France for the French. Il est temps. The time has come to get rid of all the arrogant people who wanted to dictate to the population what they should do. I am the candidate for the people. Ever since polls closed this evening, this crowd has waited to see the woman they want as the next president of France, Marine Le Pen. Her campaign slogan is, in name of the people of France, and if you hear the insults her supporters throw at political rivals, you'll see that France is extremely divided. There were clashes this evening in Paris between police and voters frustrated with the projected election result. This has become known as the most stressful election in modern-day France. Up and down the country, in bars and living rooms, people were glued to their screens as soon as polls closed. Left-wing candidates crushed. Their supporters were bitterly disappointed. Monsieur Macron and Madame Le Pen are now on the charm offensive in the lead-up to the final presidential vote. Their political visions may be clear, but their parties have never been in government. Whichever candidate France chooses, it will be a jump into the unknown. Katia Adler, BBC News, Northern France. Well, as we've been hearing, Marine Le Pen says the survival of France is at stake in the election. Her Front National party has only ever reached the second round of a presidential race once before, while Emmanuel Macron's party was set up just 12 months ago. Our France correspondent Lucy Williamson looks now at the changing face of French politics. 
One country, one electorate, two very different faces. France has chosen change, but of what sort? Emmanuel Macron was once called the champagne bubble. With no previous experience and no established party, he would, critics said, pop very quickly. Instead, he brought in those disillusioned with France's traditional parties, his liberal pro-Europe policies attracting voters from both right and left. But voters from right and left also chose Marine Le Pen, who wants everything that Emmanuel Macron does not. Leave the euro, slash immigration and clamp down on free trade. Her support has been the steadiest in this election, barely changing from months ago. So why was this result so hard to call? William and his sister Hélène had no idea who they would vote for today, even as they walked to their local polling station. They weren't alone. Almost a quarter of the electorate were thought to be unsure who they'd support. I still vote, but I don't know for who. And I'm hesitating between four. It's really hard. I need to choose one. I can vote for four. So. Months ago, this election looked far more certain. The favourite then was the Conservative candidate Francois Fillon. He fought on through a financial scandal as voters left him, adamant, until tonight, that he would win. On Thursday, a reminder of the challenges France is facing, the latest in a long series of attacks. It could have been a sign for some that this was time for experience, not experiment. So why try someone new? The first one, Macron, because he was the candidate of hope. The second, Marine Le Pen, because she was the candidate of anger. And you see the conflict between these two emotions. And more profoundly, because the two traditional political parties that have been leading France for the last decade both collapsed. After months of uncertainty, France has opted for two different futures hope or anger, free trade or protectionism, EU member or not. All that stands in the way of power is one more vote. In a moment, we'll hear from our Europe editor, Katia Adler, who's at Marine Le Pen's headquarters. But first, let's talk to our France correspondent, Lucy Williamson, in Paris, where Emmanuel Macron has been holding a victory rally tonight. Lucy, some of the other candidates have already come out in support of Monsieur Macron. Yes, both the socialist candidate Benoit Hamon and the conservative candidate Francois Fillon have now thrown their weight behind the newcomer, Emmanuel Macron. This is a man who made it through the first round of this election, partly by drawing on the supporters from those two established parties. Now he's got the support of the parties themselves. There's a long tradition in French politics here of different political groups coming together in the second round of elections to block the Front National. And predictions here say that Mr Macron may be able to draw on that same united front here. But of course, this election has been nothing if not unpredictable. And so until those votes are cast on the 7th of May, nothing is certain. And uh, Katia, if I can turn to you, the final outcome of that uh, May the 7th uh, final round. How could it affect France's standing in Europe and the rest of the world? It'll have a huge effect, Clive, and that's why the world cares so much about these elections, not just the supporters here at the National Front, who you can hear are, are pretty rowdy. France, of course, is one of Europe's largest economies um, and it has a big power inside the European Union. So whoever France's next president is, that will have a big effect too then on Brexit talks, on the future of the euro and of the European Union as a whole. And I'll explain why. Emmanuel Macron, he is very pro-EU. He canvasses with an EU flag alongside the French flag. And he's also very pro-international trade agreements. Whereas Marine Le Pen, she's anti-globalization, anti-euro. She wants to pull France out of the currency. And she'd like to hold a referendum on France's membership of the EU as well. Two very different visions for France that will have a big, big impact in and outside the country. OK, Katia, many thanks for that. Katia Adler there. And uh, to you, Lucy, thanks again. Lucy, Lucy Williamson there in Paris.
Now to the UK election, and Jeremy Corbyn says he'll order a review of all aspects of UK defence policy if he becomes Prime Minister. The Labour leader speaking to the BBC's Andrew Marr also refused to confirm whether renewing the Trident nuclear weapons system would be in his party's election manifesto. But a spokesman later made it clear Labour did support retaining Trident. In response, the Conservatives claim Labour would dismantle the UK's defences. Our political correspondent Vicky Young has the story. Jeremy Corbyn has an army of loyal supporters who've kept him at the helm of the Labour Party despite opposition from many of his own MPs. But now he has to introduce himself to a wider audience and persuade voters he's ready to be Prime Minister. Some of his views have caused huge controversy even within his own party. Mr Corbyn is a unilateralist opposed to nuclear weapons. So would Labour's election manifesto include a commitment to renew Trident? We will have a strategic defence review immediately, which will include all aspects of defence, as most incoming governments do, actually. In fact, I think all have. And we would then look at the situation at that time. After the interview, a party spokesman was forced to issue a statement clarifying the situation, saying the decision to renew Trident had been taken and Labour supported that. And what about the fight against so-called Islamic State? Mr Corbyn said he might suspend airstrikes on targets in Iraq and Syria. And what would he do if intelligence chiefs came to him with this information? The leader of ISIS, we know where he is, we can take him out with a drone strike. Can we have your permission? What do you tell them? What I would tell them is, give me the information you've got, tell me what, how accurate that is, and tell me what you think can be achieved by this, but the point if, has... But if they do know where he is, if they do know where he is, I'm look, asking you about decisions no, you would have I to take as Prime Minister. can I take you back to the whole point? Yeah. What is the objective here? Is the objective to start more strikes that may kill many innocent people, as has happened, or is the objective to get a political solution in Syria? Labour is keen to focus on domestic issues in this election. On grammar schools, Mr Corbyn said that he did not like selective education. On the economy, he repeated his promise to set up a public national investment bank to plough money into new industries and infrastructure. And on private service providers in the NHS, he said he would phase out those contracts and bring in directly employed staff. Jeremy Corbyn's supporters say he's been hampered as leader by disloyal MPs and a negative press. This election campaign is a chance for him to lay out his vision for Britain, to tell voters exactly what he stands for. But any confusion over policy will be seized on by his opponents. In the opening stage of this campaign, the Tories have made strong leadership a central theme. Today they said Mr Corbyn wasn't suitable to be Prime Minister. It's just chaos. I mean, you know, Jeremy Corbyn is putting himself forward as the next Prime Minister of this country. And I think what we've seen this morning is that we would basically have a coalition of chaos if Jeremy Corbyn became Prime Minister of this country. Thank you very much. The Conservatives are portraying Jeremy Corbyn as a man unable to take the difficult decisions that come with being in power. But his allies say he's a man of principle and they believe voters will warm to him the more they hear his message. Vicky Young, BBC News, Westminster. Well, some of the other parties have been outlining proposals that could appear in their election manifestos. The Work and Pension Secretary, Damien Green, has confirmed the Conservatives would cap the gas and electricity bills of millions of households if they win the election. I think that the uh, people feel that some of the big energy companies uh, have taken advantage of them with the, the tariffs. While the Liberal Democrats have ruled out being part of another coalition government, their leader, Tim Farron, says there are no circumstances in which the party would prop up the Conservatives or Labour. Voting Liberal Democrat is not a proxy for anything else. Voting Liberal Democrat is a vote against a hard Brexit, a vote for the people to have the final say, not the politicians, and a vote for a decent, strong opposition. And finally, the leader of UKIP, Paul Nuttall, says the party wants to ban full-face veils worn by a minority of Muslim women. He says the move is part of what he calls UKIP's integration agenda. Look at some of the statistics. 58% of Muslim women are economically inactive. 22% don't speak English to any great level. What we need to do is we need to ensure that these people are fully integrated into British society, and you can't do that if you're hidden behind a veil. And you can find more on the general election on our website, that's at bbc.co.uk forward slash news.
Now, today's London Marathon saw a new world record, a pair of newlyweds among the runners, and a man who sacrificed his own time to help another competitor cross the line. 40,000 people in all took part, and Joe Wilson was watching. A journey of 26 miles begins with a single hoot, but who's? Heads together, the starters and the masses. By 10.30 we had a thrilling finish. David Weir in the pale blue top was desperately seeking a seventh London Marathon victory to mellow the bitter disappointment of the Paralympics. And the Weirwolf roars again. At one point I didn't think I would even make the start line, so to, to come away and win um, for me personally is uh, an amazing feeling. Missing from the elite women's field, last year's winner Jemima Sumgong, while she'd failed a doping test. Kenya's Mary Katani won it on her own. Westminster witnessing a triumph of human spirit, not for the first or the last time. In a marathon where the women's race is separate, this was the fastest time ever. Mary Katani of Kenya. Daniel Wanjiru's victory in the men's elite race was the biggest of his career. That everywhere personal limits were being stretched. The blue headbands of the Heads Together charity found many heads. The charitable causes and accompanying outfits almost defied imagination. The success in the marathon takes many forms. When Matthew Rees spotted David Wyeth out on his feet, with the end in sight, his instinct was to assist. Forget his own time, come on. They'd never met before. They made it. It's the same thing anyone else would have done, so you know, I just helped, helped the guy out when he was in need. And I'm glad he got to the line, and I'm glad he's OK. Well, this is the triumphant stage of the marathon, the right side of the finishing line. Doesn't matter if you're exhausted. Forget about the time. You've made it, and you've earned a medal. Not an OBE, but you never know who's going to be doing the presentation. Now, perhaps the only way to feel closer to the marathon is to run it yourself. How are you doing, all right? There's always next year. Joe Wilson, BBC News in central London. Well, you saw there both Prince William and Harry, along with Kate, supporting runners in the London Marathon on behalf of their charity Heads Together. The royals have been praised by groups who support the bereaved for speaking out about the impact on their lives of the death of their mother, Diana, but say there's a need for more help for those coping with the death of a loved one. Here's our health editor, Hugh Pym. Kevin lost his wife to cancer eight years ago. Since then, he's been helped by meeting others who've been bereaved through the social support group, widowed and young. At times, Kevin says he found himself in a difficult place with his well-being at risk. It's a very traumatic experience, and my own experience of, of that, and um, it turns your whole world upside down. Um, you really don't know where to turn or how to cope initially. Um, and yes, I'm, it certainly does affect your mental health overall. Yvonne's experience was similar. Her husband Simon died suddenly on a business trip. She and her children were left struggling as they tried to cope with the shock. And in time that begins to happen, things begin to normalise. Yvonne acknowledges now that she came close to a mental health crisis. I spiralled down very, very rapidly and, uh, and I was, got to the point of actually beginning to think like there's no point in my life anymore and, and the thought of ending it began to cross my mind. And was there anything that helped you pull away from that? Yes, finding peer support, finding support initiatives that were where people actually understood what I was going through and were able to encourage me and give me hope. She says she was lucky to have that support. Others often don't get it. So she set up a group and website signposting where help and counselling can be found. It's the sort of resource which might have helped Angela after her husband took his own life. She says nobody told her where to find support beyond her immediate family. There was no formal process, if you like, that ran alongside the other processes that we become involved in, like coroner's courts and, um, and you know, kind of funeral directors and things like that. There was nothing offered to me that was specific to my uh, bereavement. Um, and looking back, I wish it had have been offered. She's now campaigning on behalf of people bereaved by suicide who are known to be more likely to develop mental health problems. There's people who then consider suicide because they've been bereaved by suicide because this is such a huge thing that comes crashing into your world. 
you know if, if if you don't receive the help that you need to navigate your way through this situation then absolutely it can lead to mental health issues some need a lot more support beyond friends and family others don't but there's a clear message from those affected the challenges and health risks for the bereaved need more recognition along with places to turn for help hugh pym bbc news now with all the day's sport, here's Ollie Foster at the BBC Sports Centre. Hi there, Ollie. Thanks, Clive. It's been a very busy day of league and cup football in England and Scotland. There are full highlights of what happened after the news, but if you want to see some goals and results, here they come. This season's FA Cup final is going to be between Chelsea and Arsenal. The Gunners beat Manchester City 2-1 after extra time. David Ornstein reports from Wembley. They came en masse with hope renewed. A season that promised so much has so far failed to deliver. But there can be no looking back. For Arsenal and Manchester City, the FA Cup is their route to glory. Because glory is how these managers will be judged. And it was City who initially looked the more convincing. Sergio Aguero denied when the cross to him was ruled to have gone out of play. Replays possibly suggested otherwise. After half-time, there would be no stopping Aguero, a precise finish putting City on course for the final. Arsenal, though, had other ideas, and within 10 minutes they were level. Nacho Monreal timing his run and finish to perfection, giving the Gunners a lifeline. Soon they were saved again, now by the post, while City also hit the bar, before at the other end Danny Welbeck went within inches of winning it. Arsenal carried that momentum into extra time and capitalised when Alexis Sanchez put them ahead with his 24th and perhaps most important goal of the campaign. It proved decisive. So Arsenal and in particular their manager Arsene Wenger have responded to their critics. They'll return here to face Chelsea for the trophy next month. For City and Pep Guardiola, it's huge disappointment. David Ornstein, BBC News at Wembley. Celtic are still on for the treble. The Premiership champions and League Cup winners are into the Scottish Cup final to face Aberdeen. That's after they beat Rangers 2-0 at Hampden Park. Scott Sinclair scored their second from the spot. In the Premier League, third-place Liverpool lost 2-1 at home to Crystal Palace. Christian Benteke scored twice against his former club. And Manchester United are still fifth in the table after winning 2-0 away at Burnley. Great Britain finished fourth in the standings at the European Gymnastics Championships. Ellie Downey won four of their six medals in Romania. The 17-year-old, who won all-around gold earlier in the competition, finishing with a silver on the floor. And also in Romania, Great Britain were beaten in their ill-tempered Fed Cup tie. Johanna Conta and Heather Watson both lost their singles rubbers today. And that's all your sport this evening. Clive. Ollie, many thanks for that. And that's it. Now it's time for all the news where you are. Have a very good night.